Uh, okay, so chat's disabled. Q and A is where people are are pre presenting their information. Stephanie, you want to email her super quick? Okay, and um, I'm ready to share, and we'll get started here as quick as we can. Um, I'm going to say we should get started and that way we'll have some time for Q&A at the end and um, hopefully Kat will be able to pop back on. She was having, she was going to help facilitate some things, but we're a savvy crew and I think we can, we can get going here. So I'm going to share, um, share my screen. Uh, and we are delighted to be representing the America's Longleaf and to talk about our forestry um, collaborative work uh, and be part of this Network for Landscape Conservation webinar series and really appreciate being pulled in and asked to do this. Um, there's four of us that are representing the America's Longleaf and we're going to speak um, briefly to this presentation and then there should be some Q&A at the end. Um, and I believe you can put your questions in the chat or Q&A as we're going and hopefully Kat will be able to hop on to help facilitate that at the end. Um, See Kat, so, I think Kat's oh, coming back. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> um, hey Kat, we kind of got things rolling here a little bit. Okay, great. Can you hear me okay? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I sincerely apologize. My Wi-Fi went out. Um, so you guys keep rolling and then I will do the introductions and everything at the end. Apologies again and looking forward to presentation. Thank you guys. Okay, so I'll just jump in and then yeah, Kat can take it away at the end after we after we finish each of our parts. Um, so my name is Colette DeGarity and I'm the uh, Longleaf Pine Whole System Director for the Nature Conservancy and I'm currently chairing the Longleaf Partnership Council for America's Longleaf and again real happy to be here to present this. I'm not um, sure if, uh, who all is on the call so I'm just going to orient folks just a bit early on to Longleaf and why it's so important and why there's this forestry collaborative uh, working towards restoring Longleaf. In the southeast, uh, longleaf pine used to cover approximately 90 million acres across the south, shown here in green on the map, and was our native forest. Um, and we had, uh, it, you know, numerous benefits to longleaf, uh, huge biodiversity with plants and animals uh, covering the landscape with that historic range. And we're we're learning more and more about the resiliency of longleaf. Uh, it's a fire adapted species. We use controlled burns to manage it. So it, we have that fire culture here in the south and that helps reduce the risk of wildfire. That fire also helps really promote and instigate that really great understory biodiversity. And, um, and we're also learning more about the wind resistance as we're seeing more storm events. Uh, longleaf tends to be more wind resistant compared to other pine species. And we know that it's also insect pest pathogen resistant as well compared to other species as shown in that loblolly plantation picture where a big insect infestation took out a lot of trees. And longleaf pine is also really economically important in the South. It's a really hardy, um, strong wood species. And you can have both economic value and ecological value in a longleaf pine forest when some selectively thinning and sustainably harvesting the, that, those forests to thin those stands, get sunlight to the ground for uh, biodiversity benefit, but then also use that wood for good products like poles or furniture or other timber um, economic products as well. So recognizing this wonderful importance of our historic and native longleaf pine species, uh, around 22 partners came together um, around 2007, 2008, and uh, wanted to work together collectively to protect uh, America's longleaf and restore these forests across the Southeast. Uh, a range-wide conservation plan was created with this unified vision from partners, and each of these folks in, um, made a commitment to invest their time and resources. And a really important component of that too was the federal support. Some of our federal agencies helped instigate the writing of that uh, range-wide conservation plan and helped really kick uh, kickstart this process along with a, a foundational nonprofit, Longleaf Alliance, who's been working on restoring Longleaf for a really long time. 
Um, but then we, we start to talk about these tiers of governance structure that started to evolve from that conservation plan. Uh, a, a important top tier was a federal coordinating committee that developed a national MOU was signed uh, in 2010 um, after that conservation plan was written. And this, this was signed by the secretaries of interior and um, the agriculture and then a, a national representative from the Department of Defense. Longley Force are really important in our military installations for training and so forth. So we have that top tier um, federal coordinating committee that helped channel resources and, and focus on longleaf restoration. And then we have a longleaf partnership council that developed and has been ongoing since 2010. Uh, currently at 2022, we have upwards of 30 partners and you can see those partners listed here. Great representation from folks uh, uh, in the education sector, our, our federal and state partners, our, our private partners, private landowners, uh, and so on, and industry representatives. We want all those collective voices at the table to say how what needs to happen right now to continue to move the needle on increasing longleaf pine stands across the range. And we meet around twice annually uh, with a lot of conversations in between with the leadership team on, on how we're moving forward with our progress and our, our planning. So then the, uh, the other scale here is on the ground, our boots on the ground. We have 18 local implementation teams that were developed uh, and each of these teams have a coordinator and have their own collective uh, partners working on the ground to restore longleaf around key focal areas, uh, significant geographical areas that were identified uh, using science and um, uh, you know, as that conservation plan was developed. A key aspect of these lo local implementation teams is that they have consistent funding sources, which helps uh, maintain that consistency of work. The National Fish and Wildlife Foundation is a great partner that's developed a longleaf stewardship fund. And a lot of partners um, help contribute to that fund that then coordinators apply for for those specific projects happening on the ground. And it, it maintains that consistent level of work moving, moving forward. Um, so a lot of you know photos here of showcasing things from planting, prescribed fire and controlled burning, just a huge aspect, uh, monitoring wildlife and then celebrating those successes is really important like the five year anniversary shown here in Washington DC. So some of these elements uh, just to touch on before moving to some of the other speakers here um, that helps keep our collaborative moving forward since 2010, you know, it's more, more than 10 years now, we've been continuing to work on this in a consistent way. Uh, the America's Longleaf uh, Partnership was recognized by Forest Service as a national model for shared stewardship, a concept that aims to work in the right places at the right scale and in the right way to achieve collaborative land management goals across boundaries. 86% of the land in the Southeast is private. And, and so we need to make sure we're working on private, public, uh, you know, federal, state lands and utilizing those resources to that best advantage. So some of those elements include that shared vision, that shared vision of, of everybody coming to the table at the, uh, writing that conservation plan initially help kickstart the effort and then that commitment and focus to maintaining that vision from partners. People um, bringing resources to the table uh, with staff and funding was so important. Working at those different scales, like I just mentioned, and we're gonna hear from Deb um, later about one of those local implementation teams that's working, but then thinking holistically about how we're reaching our goals um, at scale and making it that big difference is important. And organized collaboration, and what I mean by that is those details really matter. We hire facilitators at our meetings to make sure we're, we're effectively using our time. We have uh, our records maintained and so that we can look back at notes and think through what's accomplished. Um, we measure our outcomes so we know where we're going and Kyle and Stephanie are gonna speak to that in just a minute. And then we adaptively manage based on what we're learning from what we're measuring. So we, we can pivot and adjust our work. And, and through those meetings, we talk about that and make those changes. Sharing and celebrating successes is so important uh, to um, have that fellowship time to make sure people stay invested and, and recognize the work that's happened. 
And then maintaining champions at those different scales is also really important uh, so that you have those drivers of the work that's happening. So that's, um, I'm, I'm gonna stop there with uh, giving you an introduction of America's Longleaf, and then I'll pass it over to um, Kyle and Stephanie to talk about a bit more specifically about the measures uh, about um, America's Longleaf. All right, well, thank you. Thank you, Colette. My name's Kyle Jones. I work with the U.S. Forest Service. I've been with our agency for about 21 uh, years now, and I've specifically worked uh, within America's Longleaf Restoration Initiative for uh, the past seven years. And I'll go ahead and, and tell you, I think I have the, the best job in our agency. It, this is such a great initiative uh, to work in. And before I talk about the importance of metrics and reporting, um, really the, the success of this initiative is connected to the foundation that was laid when this initiative was launched. And I think several folks are on this call today who were part of that process. And that, that foundation that was created really enabled us to build and to grow and to, to take this initiative to what it is today. So uh, thank you for that. Thank you for that, Colette. Uh, as far as the importance of metrics and reporting, a lot of that, that goes without without saying. Uh, uh, when it comes to metrics and properly reporting those metrics, that's vital to the sustainability of any long-term initiative. And America's Longleaf Restoration Initiative is no exception to that. Uh, this is the, the not for the last, uh, and Stephanie, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is the 2021 report was the ninth uh, annual report that has been issued through uh, through this initiative. And what we hear, and it's been an evolution. Um, uh, by the way, all nine accomplishment reports are posted on americaslongleaf.org within the resources section. So you can go back to year one and you can, you can look at the evolution of how our reporting process has evolved over the last decade. What we're, what we're hearing today is that uh, this report, this accomplishment report that we issued through this initiative is regarded by many as the gold standard for accomplishment reporting when it comes to you know, landscape level accomplishments, which is a huge compliment when you talk about uh, a range to the magnitude that our longleaf range is, approximately 90 million acres. So those metrics, back to the, the significance of those metrics, uh, within the Forest Service, we like to say, you know, outputs or metrics or what lead to those ultimate desired outcomes. So if you don't have a good gauge on the metrics that are being uh, derived through this or any other initiative, it's really hard to, to capture, to get an idea of that return on our investment. Are we accomplishing what we've set out to accomplish? And those, uh, those metrics are the gateway to those desired uh, to those desired outcomes. It's kind of our, our report card, so to speak. Uh, I believe we're going on multiple years, just to kind of give you an idea of the magnitude of the metrics. I think we're going on a couple of years now where our metrics exceeded 2 million, you know, 2 million acres impacted. Uh, also, uh, and I love this piece that Colette just pulled up. This is an excerpt from our, uh, right out of our 2021 report. And before I talk about that a little bit. Um, the other key, uh, you know, thing that is uh, connected to our accomplishment report is it's an accomplishment report, but it's also a marketing piece. This is the first document that we put in folks' hands when um, when they start asking about America's longleaf restoration. Uh, initiative, and I'll I'll speak to how we kind of evolved into that here in just a minute. Okay, you can go you can go to the next slide, uh, Colette. This right here just kind of gives you an example of what you'll see when you look within our report. This uh, our report 
it showcases the successes, it energizes partners, uh, it, it assesses our progress toward the goals uh, of the Longleaf Partnership Council and our range-wide conservation uh, plan. And, and uh, this, when you put this report in the hands of any interested stakeholder or potential funder to this initiative, this is what gives them confidence and excitement that that uh, we're, we're, we're accomplishing what we set out to do. And um, a couple of the lessons learned, and this is, again, this is a great slide out. This is a great excerpt from the most recent report. We've, we've learned, se there's several lessons that we've learned, you know, through the, through the last decade, over the last decade in issuing this report. You know, one, um, you know, you gotta make uh, the, the metrics and reporting easy. Uh, you ca it can't be too convoluted. It has to be streamlined and has to be transparent. Uh, another thing we learned is we have to be able to adapt along the way to improve our processes and efficiencies. And I'll circle back to that in just a second. And then last, which may be most important, we have to ensure that these reports are engaging and easy to read with photographs and infographics and focus on engaging content. When, when you put your report or this report into the hands of folks, you want them to, you want it to compel them uh, to tell the story, to, to, to compel them to learn more. And, and, um, and that is where we're at today. Uh, if you go back, I mentioned the nine reports that are on our website. If you go back to the beginning, you will notice that the early on accomplishment reports are real heavy on text and numbers. And those of us who, are, were, who were working in the initiative, that was fine with us. I mean, I mean we like that. We like to see those texts and numbers. But as we learned that uh, as far as uh, sharing that with the public and others and trying to garner additional support, uh, I remember, I think, uh, Ryan, Ryan Bollinger uh, is on the, on the call today. He's with the Longleaf Alliance. I was talking with Ryan about uh, this report several years back and, and Ryan uh, said to me, he says, uh, you know, Kyle, I think there's a better way. I think there's a better way we can roll up these accomplishments. I think there's a better way to present this information. And because we all work so well within the initiative, we were able to adapt and to improve those processes. And four or five years ago, we transitioned uh, our report to be more outcome centered, to be more, uh, to have more infographics, to, to shorten the, the accomplishment report. And immediately when we made that transition, um, we started receiving positive feedback from all over the nation in regards to how this report uh, was structured and the, the way the information uh, was, was portrayed. Okay, you can go to the last, next slide, uh, Colette. So I mentioned the, the outputs, um, you know, translate to the outcomes. And this is so important within this initiative. You know, uh, you know, many of us who've worked in this for a while, we always say America's Lonely for Restoration Initiative is it's not a tree planting program. Uh, the, the reason we do this initiatives uh, or this initiative, the reason we have so much buy-in from the multitude of stakeholders is because of these high level outcomes. So within our report early on, we were heavily, uh, heavily metric centered, heavily text centered. And as we've progressed over the last decade with these accomplishment reports, we've transitioned to being more outcome, um, outcome centered. So within our reports, when we can hit on these high level outcomes and how this initiative has directly impacted, you know, these, you know, these items here on this slide, then, uh, then that really connects with, with all of the contributors into this initiative as well as the public. So make that as much of a focus, you know, as much as possible. So we, we still, we've come a long way. We still have a long way to go, but, um, but uh, that's kind of the evolution of our, of, uh, and transformation of our accomplishment reporting process over the last nine or 10 years. And with that, I'll pass it on to Stephanie to, to elaborate. 
Great, thanks, Kyle. So my name is Stephanie Hertz. I'm a project manager with the Texas A&M Natural Resources Institute. I support the Department of Defense Readiness and Environmental Protection Integration Program and the Natural Resources Program through a cooperative agreement. Uh, and I've been helping coordinate some of their engagement with regional partnerships like, Amer like America's Longleaf for about nine and a half years now. So you heard Kyle talk about you know, the importance of accomplishment reporting, why we spend so much time and energy into doing this year after year and how we really strive to take our metrics and make sure they mean something to people, you know, on the ground. So from here, I would like to talk a little bit about the different kinds of metrics that we collect. So perfect, this is the exact slide I'm looking for. So we, we collect traditional and non-traditional metrics. When I say traditional metrics, I'm thinking numbers that we track on a year to year basis to help us assess progress and showcase accomplishments across the range. So for America's Longleaf, we found that acres are a really helpful way and an easy way for us to collect and report our accomplishments. And so what this translates to every year, we collect acres of longleaf pine planted, um, acres of prescribed fire that happen in uh, longleaf ecosystems, acres of longleaf that have been improved through management activities, um, acres that might have been a minor component of longleaf but have transitioned to longleaf dominant. Um, we also really like to track acres of longleaf that have been protected through acquisitions and easements. So we collect all of these numbers and we do that across a wide spectrum of federal agencies, state agencies, industry, private landowner. Um, and then we analyze all of those accomplishments and we try to um, explain them down at the national and regional and state levels um, and also complete roll-ups as well. And then we're also able to assess where the accomplishments are happening on public lands versus private lands. So that's an effort that we um, think is really worthwhile to do, again, just to kind of help us assess our progress. And then on our most recent accomplishment report, which was for FY21, we were able to report over 1.6 million acres of longleaf planted, over 15 million acres of prescribed fire in longleaf, and over 325,000 acres of longleaf protected since ALRI's inception. So that's something that we were really, really excited about. But now, um, Colette, can you go to the next slide? Now we'll talk a little bit about non-traditional metrics, because it's not just about the acres, right? It's about the whole story. So um, talking about non-traditional metrics, uh, we have a couple of examples that will show you kind of what we're talking about. Again, just making sure we're telling our story. Um, every year with the accomplishment report, not only are we looking for acres, but we also go down to the local teams and we say, send us your success stories. We want to hear what are you guys doing? Is there anything special that's happened? Did you have a major event? You know, what is happening on the ground that people would get really jazzed about that hit on many different priorities of the different stakeholders? So we try to collect success stories on species and private landowners and all kinds of different stuff. And so this is a great way to tell our, our story and show how we're meeting uh, the different priorities of all the partners that are in America's Longleaf. Uh, we also think we're pretty special working at multiple scales, so local, state, and regional scales. And we have a really great um, partner representation that's engaged as well. So we started tracking how many um, participants and organizations have been participating on the Longleaf Partnership Council. And what we found since 2010 was we had over 100 representatives and 55 organizations that have served on the Longleaf Partnership Council to date. And they've done that through some of our rotating seats that rotate every two years. And this has been a key thing to keep our council fresh. We get new voices, we get new stakeholders, we get new ideas, we stay relevant. Um, and it's just a great way to make sure we're getting all kinds of expertise on the council and more and more people are hearing and understanding what America's Longleaf is all about. Um, we also really love hearing about new projects that have occurred as a result of engagement in America's Longleaf. And one of my favorite examples is the U.S. Forest Service Million Acre Challenge. So this was an ambitious plan by Region 8 of the USDA Forest Service. It was announced back in 2017 to add a million acres of longleaf pine stands on national forest system lands, which uh, would have more than doubled the longleaf acres that was present on Forest Service lands at the time. And I think that was really created um, because of engaging with America's Longleaf and the excitement of all the partners. And that's just one example, but there's many, many other great examples of new projects that have formed from partners that met through the Longleaf Partnership Council. Um, another one I wanted to mention is grant reporting that um, grantees 
will um, report back to the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. So NIFWF um, administers the Longleaf Landscape Stewardship Fund, which helps fund a lot of activities on the ground um, that our LITs do, our local implementation teams. And so the grantees, they wind up reporting things like number of landowners with changed behavior. Maybe this is a landowner that created a forest management plan uh, for Longleaf, or maybe they utilized a cost share program. Um, it could be number of people reached through educational meetings, technical assistance, trainings, um, number of people targeted through mailings or social media, um, and also the number of jobs that are created. So those are also some non-traditional metrics that are really, really informative to see how we're doing. And then we're always thinking about potential future metrics as well as our priorities evolve. So climate mitigation is something that we're really interested in. Are there metrics that we can collect there to see how we're doing? Or we also have a long only for all working group, which is um, focused on supporting minority and indigenous landowners and professionals in the field of forestry. And so are there metrics that we can start tracking there as well to see if we're having any success in our efforts. So those are just some examples of some non traditional metrics that um, help tell the whole story and show everybody what America's Longleaf is all about. Um, can you go to the next slide, Clint? Perfect. Okay, so data collection and reporting process. This is we wanted to shed a little bit of light on the process that we go through every single year. So every year in the fall, this is usually after the federal fiscal year rolls over, we do what we call an annual data call. And so we schedule a call um, usually, and actually our next data call is in another week or two. So we're like actually getting ready to start it. But we do this kickoff call with the accomplishment report writing team um, to explain the process for this year's data call, discuss any kind of changes that were made to reporting or any changes in the data that we're collecting. Um, and then we do this with a combination of state leads and federal representatives who are then responsible for reaching out to their contacts into the, the states that they work in or the programs that they oversee um, to collect and submit data through a SharePoint site to, uh, to us so we can roll everything up. And then at that time, we also ask them to submit success stories, photos, you know, any additional narrative, things that they would like highlighted in the report, we do all of that in the fall time frame. So usually in the winter time, we've gotten the data back, we start doing our data analysis. And then that helps us start putting together figures. It helps us begin doing our writing, our narrative um, as well. And that usually happens in the winter or spring timeframe. And we start laying out the report as well and, and going through some review processes. And then in the spring and the summer is usually when we try to publish the report um, so we can get it out there. And we really reach upon all of our partners. And we send them you know, the accomplishment report along with instructions on how they can help us share it. Um, we mail copies of it, but we also give instructions for social media sharing, and we just try to get as many eyes on it as possible because, you know, as Kyle mentioned, you really can't underestimate um, telling your story and just sustaining that excitement and, and what you and the partners are doing. So um, that's just a little bit about our process, what has worked for us, how we're still, still learning, but um, the way that we do it. So I hope that's been informative. And from here, I'm going to kick it over to Deb, who's going to do a presentation um, from the local implementation team perspective. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Colette and Kyle as well. Uh, my name is Deb Maurer. I work for the Nature Conservancy in North Carolina, and I am a program manager, um, director for the Southeast Coastal Plain. I've been with TNC for four years um, and have been engaged with this partnership for that amount of time as well. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Colette. Um, so I wanted to revisit this slide that Colette shared um, in terms of the elements of a, select, a successful collaborative, just to my presentation is really structured around many of these bullet points here. Um, and you go to the next slide. And also to orientate you to where I'm at, um, the Cape Fear Arch Conservation Collaborative is inside of that purple circle there. So it shares a border with um, South Carolina and actually South Carolina, there's a section of it included in the geography of this. And it runs up to the coast and up towards the sand hills. You can go to the next slide. So shared vision for stewardship and protection. This collaborative was actually formed in 2006. So a little ahead of um, the range-wide conservation plan. Um, and it really evolved around a common mission and interest in creating an interconnected network of essential ecosystems in the Cape Fear Arch for protection and restoration. So that shared vision 
um, this MOU really solidified that um, for the 27 partners that actually came to the table to discuss um, the importance of working together. Um, there was a lot of discussion about pressures of development and it wasn't long leaf specific. It was really for all of the natural lands and working lands within this partnership area. Um, so you can go to the next slide, Paulette. Um, that MOU, sort of that overarching document um, was step one in sort of getting everybody on the same page, but the commitment and focus of partners was also demonstrated in the development of a conservation plan for the partnership. Um, as I mentioned, there's 27 partners and those range from federal partners to state partners, um, municipalities, NGOs, um, and also some private industry. So we had a lot of different voices at the table, um, not only for crafting the MOU, but also for crafting this conservation plan. And what the plan did for the partnership was really, was it allowed everyone to outline what the shared values are, what the targets are and what the strategies everybody was gonna use in a collaborative way to move the needle on those threats uh, to make sure that we're meeting and achieving uh, and protecting those values. And I'll say those values again, um, some of them were specific to Longleaf, so to speak, um, in as much as the value of biodiversity. Well, the, the bulk of the biodiversity you're gonna find in our geography is within that longleaf pine ecosystem. There are other resources, certainly in, in waters and in wetlands, um, but the, the values were broad and longleaf is embedded in, in all of those. Um, you can go to the next slide, Colette. The organized collaboration, I actually interpret this a little bit differently than Colette talked about, but it, it is, I think both interpretations are critical at different scales. Um, through this partnership, we have taken um, advantage of and applied for grants through the Longleaf Landscape Stewardship Fund for many years, actually since it, it started. Um, and NIFWIP um, created this program around several different documents that outline different priorities. And you can see America's Longleaf Restoration Initiative is a part of that, right? So there's NIFWIP specific um, interests, strategies, and priorities, but America's Longleaf Restoration is embedded in that. And then there's also the Forest, um, Forest Land Stewards Partnership Business Plan and those priorities which are embedded in this program. And this is really, in terms of Longleaf in our, in our partnership and in many of the LITs across the Southeast, as Colette mentioned, this is critical for advancing our work and, and achieving our accomplishments in Longleaf. You can go to the next slide, Colette. So those NIFWIF grants, um, in this particular collaborative, uh, TNC leads the, the organization, the coordination um, for applying for these grants, but all the partners come to the table and talk about what needs are and how needs are changing. And, and every grant is a little bit, little bit different, um, but some of the core pieces of this grant, this, the, these programs related to Longleaf or these grant projects related to Longleaf are a regional shared prescribed fire crew. So TNC hires a crew, but this crew will go work on state park lands. They'll go work on uh, coastal land trust um, easements sometimes. They'll go and work on state parks, wildlife resource commission, and also TNC land. So it is truly a shared resource across boundaries um, that helps with that maintenance and restoration of the longleaf ecosystem. Um, these grants fund monitoring of rare species such as Venus flytrap, which is one of our um, showcase species that many people know. It funds a Fire in the Pines Festival, which will be happening actually this weekend in Wilmington. Um, but that's an outreach effort to um, talk about good fire and long life with the local community with the idea of changing opinion um, on fire. So a lot of different projects, tree planting, wiregrass planting, all those those various traditional metrics that Stephanie talked about. That's a lot of what these, these grants fund for our partnership. And you can go to the next slide, Colette. So measuring our outcomes, we feed directly into that range-wide accomplishments report. And that's all tied back to the range-wide conservation plan. So all of these plans work at multiple scales to really, to, to not only guide what we do, but also to share and and communicate what we do. 
And so if you look over the history of the Cape Fear Arch Conservation Collaboration and our work with NIFWIF as a, a funding partner since 2010, the numbers as they add up become pretty impressive. So we've put just about 75,000 acres of prescribed fire on the ground just with NIFWIF funding alone. And there's other fire going on. There's other fire management going on in the partnership, but this is just NIFWIF alone. Almost 17,000 acres of silvicultural thinning, uh, 3,700 acres of longleaf pine planting. You can see the ground cover restoration and you can go to the next slide. We also have outreach metrics. So with our Fire in the Pines Festival, we're going back to in-person this year. Um, you know, we've already reached almost 25,000 people face-to-face -face with this festival. Um, and I think we're set up to, to achieve another 5,000 this year. And then when COVID hit, we went virtual and we've developed all that content. Um, and this is all within the partnership, all the partners come in together. Um, and that social media and those 70,000 hits, that outreach, it blew our minds. Now we have a combination, right? So we're evolving um, as the needs evolve. Uh, monitoring, we just completed uh, the North Carolina portion of the Longleaf Element of Occurrence project. And this is what an attempt to capture some of that private lands data, where is our longleaf? Um, but through the partnership and contributions of folks on the ground, we found over 1600 new tracks of longleaf that we can map now and we can add to that bigger picture. Um, so it's not just the tree planting and the wiregrass planting, but it's some of these other, other, other work that, that is really significant, not only to the partnership, but feeds in again to that larger scale. Um, of the, the, the range-wide conservation plan. And you can go to the next slide. And then some non-traditional metrics. These are, I think we all kind of struggle, how are we gonna measure all of this? <laughs> but there's some really interesting things that come out of the work that we do. And, and one of the things we've talked a lot about, um, not only in the collaborative, but in TNC broadly, is you know how we build conservation care careers and how is the work, and this is again, just NIFWIF funded, how is the work we're doing, the hiring we're doing, the mentoring, the training, how is that feeding the larger conservation community and the new generation of practitioners that are coming up and coming into not only Longleaf, but the conservation community as a whole. And so there's lots of things that come out of our work um, through our hiring of crew members and mentoring, through students getting involved, um, through development of community collaboratives like prescribed burn associations, or even just simply offering trainings within the collaborative that have um, broader impact beyond the partnership and are not necessarily within those traditional metrics uh, that we measure. And then the final slide, Colette, is just the celebrating success and maintaining champions. It is really critical. This is a lot of hard work, right? The boots on the ground um, is a lot of labor. <laughs> it's a lot of sweat. Um, and recognizing all of the faces and all of the people and all the needed different perspectives to achieve some of these bigger goals. Um, it's just really important. And so we, we try to do that. And, you know, the collaborative meets quarterly during COVID. We had some virtual, hey, let's have a beer in the evening and see what's going on with everybody. Um, sometimes we even have shared meetings with other partnerships to talk about even broader regional successes because a lot of us are, you know, we're doing the same work in the Longleaf region, um, but it is really critical. Um, and these pictures, they really just make me smile because it's, it's a lot of hard work, but it's a lot of, a lot of people that are having a lot of fun and a lot of dedication. Um, but it takes all of these scales, all these scales of planning, all these scales, all the initiative at various scales, to have all the pieces and parts working together to really move that needle on what we're doing with Longleaf. So um, I'm super thrilled to be with you today to share this information and happy to address any questions um, that y'all may have. Thank you. Thanks, Deb. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks, Stephanie. And um, Pat, I think we can turn it back to you at, at, uh, as we've wrapped up our whole presentation here. Sounds good. Thank you guys so much. And let me know if you're having issues hearing me uh, or thumbs up if you can hear me. Yeah, you're, um, you're breaking up a tiny bit. So you could go off camera if it seems like that continues. Yeah, I think I'm going to do that. Apologies for the technical mm -hmm. issues. So I'll do that right now. 
So thank you all so much for attending and apologize for the technical uh, difficulties at the beginning of this, but really appreciative of Colette, Kyle, Deb and Stephanie for stepping in and, and rolling with it. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, so now's the time for questions. I've seen a couple questions come in the Q&A, but I'd love to hear more. Um, and I know um, our colleagues at the Network for Landscape Conservation have also um, built a couple um, of questions into uh, this webinar. So I'd love to start with one of those um, and hand it off to Colette, Deb, Stephanie, and Kyle to chat about. Um, and then as I go through some of these questions, please feel free to jump um, in and put your questions in the Q&A. Um, so I think you guys all talked about the, the non-metric side of this work. Um, so could you talk a little bit, I think Deb, you just mentioned all of that um, non-metric side and really through that NIFWF funding that came through. How are you integrating those non-metrics into the larger partnership? What are approaches you're trying to use? Because I think that is something that a lot of collaboratives struggle with is how do we measure the larger impact and the opportunities across different scales of a partnership? Well, I guess I would start with at the at the LIT at the you know the the smaller partnership scale. I can't say that we're doing a really good job of it. <laughs> what I can say is, I think those non-metrics at this point are most easily shared through stories and trends and people's experiences a lot. Like you can add up like how many people have we hired, like I did. What I can't tell you is we hired those folks, they got a lot of experience and I only know, you know, I know two people did this and two people did that, but we don't necessarily track where everybody ends up. So it's hard, it's a harder thing to track because some of these non-traditional metrics, they have a very long time frame for development, right? Um, it's kind of like changing opinion within the community. It, it doesn't happen overnight and it, to track it just takes different resources than something that's a, quantifiable um, thing you can put on a map. So I think some of it is is simply sharing stories and information um, and keeping that communication about those things. I don't have like great insight on how do we do this at a really large scale. I mean, Colette and I were part of a bigger discussion in TNC talking about this not too long ago. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and you're, I think you're just right, Deb, is, as far as that, and Stephanie hit on it too, and um, when she was talking about the assembly of the report and gathering those stories from the field, right, and, and an official capacity to, that goes in our accomplishment reporting. But those kinds of stories are also shared during our Longleaf Partnership Council meetings and in between and side conversations. So, as Deb mentioned, the trends, right? What's happening on the ground? What are we seeing? How is cost share funding being utilized? Are we seeing gaps? Are we seeing needs? Um, how is uh, prescribed fire hitting the ground? Do we have enough leaders? Uh, do we have enough training being implemented? And, and so then, you know, we talk about those aspects, those stories, those examples hitting the ground and we adapt, but documenting them in some kind of official capacity can be more challenging. I think the shared stewardship report that um, I wrote for Forest Service to kind of help catalyze this talk as, as a good way to document the st some stories and aspects of what's happening in a larger partnership. And there's some appendices in there and other reporting and presentations um, and our, our documents um, and our new conservation plan that we're working on and getting ready to come out will, will also help shed some light on what we've done in the past and where we're going as well. Oh, thank you, I've uh, put in the link there for folks that wanna read a little bit more about uh, some of the things we talked about today. Other thoughts, Kyle or Stephanie about that question? Uh, I guess my comment would be as far as when we do find these success stories or these metrics, it, we may not be able to track them at the level of detail that, that we want, but we do um, try to share those stories, Colette, like you said, at the partnership council meetings, but we also share them on Facebook. You know, we get our partners to share these stories and kind of have them come out. And then we try to be adaptive to what people are really resonating with and then try to drill down and say, okay, how can we track that a little bit better? Um, I think in the beginning, there was a lot of interest in like the acres and the plantings and all this stuff. And at one point we heard like, 
we want more photos of people doing stuff and more stories about how this impacts people. And so that's something that we were like, okay, we need to try to see like what kind of impacts we can track there as well. So it's sort of a, we're learning as we go. I appreciate that, Stephanie. It's um, learning as we go is a trend in collaborative conservation. And I think that's a great um, phrase that we all resonate with. So I appreciate it. And that's why we bring um, incredible partners like you guys to share your lessons learned. So um, I just wanted to ask one question that came in the Q&A. Um, it's focused a lot on uh, Sentinel landscapes. Um, so for those who are not familiar, I'll just read some context here from um, Kent Wimmer. Um, so there's a lot of wonderful partners in the Northwest Florida Sentinel landscapes and America's Longleaf and the four Sentinel landscapes in the Southeast share many of the same partners and have complementary goals. So the Northwest Florida uh, Sentinel Landscape, which was recently just designated and working to support funding for LTA so they may serve additional public and private lands. What else can the Sentinel Landscapes do in your region to better support the work of, of this um, effort? And, and yeah, just kind of how you guys work with Sentinel Landscapes, what, what does that look like? Um, and what does that coordination look like since there are a lot of similar partners? I can take a first stab at that. So you can't, you're, you're definitely right. Um, there are a lot of sun landscapes that are in the longleaf range. Um, and I would say that we do try to have um, representatives of a local sun landscape attend our LPC meetings, uh, either in person or virtually if they can. Um, we actually had, I think somebody from um, your, uh, some, somebody from the Northwest Florida sun landscape came and gave a talk at our May LPC meeting, just so everybody can kind of learn from one another. And then perhaps, you know, on some of our other meetings where we have a virtual component, maybe the Sentinel landscape coordinators could try to join, you know, our other LPC meetings. And, you know, there's probably lots of opportunities that can be discovered that way. And then all of the sidebar meetings that happen at those, those particular gatherings. Um, you're right, there's so many like partners that overlap between the Sentinel landscapes and America's Longleaf that um, I'm sure there's all kinds of exciting uh, projects that could occur just from some more communication. And I can chime in too here. Uh, so there's the regional partnership Surpass, um, which I'm, I'll butcher the Southeast. Uh, you could probably state all those letters <laughs> really quick, Stephanie. So it's it's a Department of Defense um, led uh, collaboration and Sentinel Landscapes are very connected to that program as well. And there's there's a overlapping representatives on, on both of those. Uh, working groups and um, partnerships as well that have mutual interests and just slightly tilted vision where, you know, Surpass is aiming for national defense goals in alignment with environmental goals. And America's Longleaf is very focused on restoring acres of Longleaf. Uh, so you've got those slightly different visions, but there's a lot of connections and overlap that do happen uh, with those two partnerships. And I believe uh, through the Longleaf Alliance, there's prescribed fire, uh, representative on the coast of Georgia that work, works through funding from the Sentinel landscape on the coast there, but that person is also helping think through uh, longleaf restoration fire application, um, which meets the America's longleaf goals as well. So I think that's a great example of those mutual, mutual goals occurring uh, with different resources and, and partnerships that are kind of moving parallel together. That's great, Colette. Thank you so much. And I think we're getting a lot of questions around this. How do we better collaborate? How do we join the meetings? I think we just saw one from the Shortleaf Pine Initiative and the White Oak Initiative, really just trying to get a better understanding of how do we partner in restoration efforts across the, the landscape? So Deb, I know you are kind of on the ground scale um, and in that role. Um, how has how has the multi-scaled kind of approach that you guys and the strategy that's been happening for 10 years, um, has that helped you guys meet partners on the ground? Has that helped you guys uh, coordinate better at these different scales? And just talk a little bit more about how that government structure um, kind of boosts the for restoration action. You are breaking up just a tad. 
Um, I'm not sure I caught the, you're wondering, I'm, I'm not sure what I caught what the, you're asking what influences collaboration at multiple scales or? Yeah, how do you collaborate across scales um, from your perspective being on the ground and do you meet partners? Has that helped you meet partners as you work at multiple scales of this initiative? Hopefully I didn't break up too much there. Nope, I got that. Um, I'm thinking about that a little bit um, because I don't always, you know, it's easy for me to frame our work in the partnership and think about the scales in which how does that then influence the broader regional scales and then the, the range wide to the range wide scale. Like within the partnership itself, I don't really think about it that way. Um, but I will say that I think what what influences the breadth and the degree to which you partner with folks that you wouldn't necessarily think to partner with, it's really embedded in that conservation plan and really bringing folks together. When you have the conservation plan that identifies a whole variety of values and targets, not just those that you think of as like traditional conservation, by having a broad and inclusive planning process, you then inherently lay the groundwork for having to reach out beyond those partners that you might traditionally reach out to. And I think that in and of itself, it, it just sets the stage for those broader partnerships. I don't really think of it in terms of scale, um, but I really, there is, I'm not a big planner, but the importance of planning, it, it is really key for these conservation collaboratives. Um, and that's one of the things that comes out of it. It's not just that importance, shared vision, shared strategy, shared values, all of that. It's really how you can broaden the resources available in your region to tackle it. And those are often broader than you think. And there's more resources out there than you think, but you have to go outside of your, your, your box um, to work with folks. So. I don't know if that answers your question exactly the way you thought I would, but that's that's what comes to mind. That's fantastic. Any other thoughts on that? I have to say real quick because I I used I started out um, with America's Long coordinating a local implementation team in South Carolina, and now I, I have the perspective of working more at scale. So when I was leading that local implementation team, like Deb is now in North Carolina. Uh, I also had the opportunity to sit on the Longleaf Partnership Council as a rep LIT representative. We have two that have two that are always sitting on the council and have rotating terms, which allows us to have this great exchange and perspective of what's happening on the ground locally. Also, those LIT coordinators and representatives can help share their stories about what's happening on the ground. And then people can have these aha moments about, yes, I need to think along those lines, or I need to take that example and try it where I am. And the Fire in the Pines Festival is an example of that, creating a festival around prescribed fire application, controlled burning, teaching the public what it means to do that, learning from one state, um, I believe North Carolina has been, has set the bar really high, and then uh, replicating that in other areas has, is an example of, of that, that, that that has occurred. I think there's also that opportunity to meet other partners, to hear about programs, uh, funding opportunities, and ways you can leverage your resources. All of that occurs in those regional meetings. And so folks then can take that knowledge back down to the ground and apply it and vice versa. Uh, folks that have brought information to the ground help us thinking in this Longleaf Partnership Council as a leadership team, oh, how do we need to pivot to grab more resources for this or fill the needs there? Um, or to think through research needs that we really need to answer questions uh, about to get to help folks on the ground. Thanks so much, Colette. Hopefully I'm not breaking up too much, but appreciate that perspective. Um, and just uh, one note, I know we're winding down and I have a million and one converse, uh, questions to ask you guys. So um, that being said, um, 
you also mentioned the need for facilitation and a lot of these meetings and this collaboration across different scales. So I just would love to hear from all of you just some perspective on how you do facilitate those meetings at multiple scales. Um, just uh, quickly to, to understand a little bit more about why that facilitation is necessary to approach um, kind of the lessons learned as you go through large meetings. I'm happy to take it, but Kyle or, or Stephanie, do you either of you want to take it since uh, you haven't talked as much? Kyle, you haven't talked as much. How about you? <laughs> I know within our within our America's Lonely Restoration Initiative, that's something that we we paid a lot of attention to, and uh, bringing in a uh, a consistent a facilitator, Nancy Walters, has been instrumental. She's not just a facilitator; she's actually has some ownership uh, in the initiative, and uh, so that has uh, benefited us tremendously uh, for many years having someone like that. And she's also involved in other initiatives as well. So she's helped bridge the gap and connect uh, America's Lonely Leaf Restoration initiatives, uh, initiative to other initiatives on a broader, uh, on a broader scale. But this, this topic of better collaborating, uh, you know, I think it is something that we have always struggled with somewhat. We tend to get caught in, you know, within our own initiatives. And if it's not careful, we'll miss opportunities uh, to operate at a broader, more efficient scale. So uh, I think what was the, you know, learning as we go, that is something that I would put at the very top of the list um, with, you know, something that, you know, there's opportunity to do, you know, much better. In, and from a from uh, being on the federal side, in doing that, we can make our dollars and our funding go so much further. I've been concerned that we can get too piecemealed out with so many initiatives out there, kind of doing their own thing. That we really miss the we get watered down from a funding standpoint and from a resource standpoint. So, in my opinion, that's something that's at the top of the list. Uh, and 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 certainly room for you know improvement uh, you know within. Thanks so much, Kyle and Kala and others. Please feel free. I know we're a little bit over, but I've let folks who have to leave. There's the information for our series and the website for the recording. But Kala, I'd love to hear your perspective and Deb and Stephanie if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, I'd, I'd just say it's worth investing funding and resources in that facilitation, record keeping, helping to make meetings run smoothly, get the barbecue to draw the crowds, um, because that type of fellowship and that organized way to, to gather and, and keep the meeting moving helps people stay engaged and want to return uh, back to a meeting because they know it's time well spent. Yeah, and I'll, I'll go next. I completely, I, I don't think I realized the value of facilitator until I saw a really good facilitator, um, Nancy Walters, doing our meetings, and she just keeps us on time. She is, you know, a great neutral party. Sometimes when there's like differing opinions, you know, we're able to reach some sort of consensus. Um, if there's a topic we haven't quite resolved, we're able to like really make sure we get that resolution that we need. And like Colette said, people feel like it's time well spent because we just try to be really efficient and really organized going into the meeting so we know exactly what we wanna get, you know, what we need to present. And um, it's just, uh, it's invaluable really. So I would say it's, it's, worth, it's worth having a facilitator when you're dealing with large groups of people of different kinds of stakeholders, it's just great. Yeah, I agree with everything that Colette and Stephanie just said. I would say at the sort of at the ground level, at the partnership scale, um, some people might roll their eyes and say, oh, money for a coordinator, like how are we going to do that? <laughs> I would say that in some cases, it is important to invest that money in a person to do that. And in, in other instances, you might be able to do it um, with the commitment of one or two partners in like co-leading. But it's got to be it's got to be the focus of someone's work plan. There's got to be a commitment, and that might be a commitment that shifts over time. So it's not burden, not not on the shoulders of any one organization or partner um, in the collaboration, but 
it is a it, it is an important function that needs to be met no matter how you meet it, no matter what approach you take to meeting it. Really appreciate it. And I know we're running over, so I want to be respectful of our panelists time but thank you so much for this conversation again sorry for the technical issues on the nlc end but um please check out our website for upcoming webinars um i expect kyle colette deb and stephanie you'll probably be hearing from me personally about all the questions that i didn't get to ask you um so again thank you so much for the time really appreciate it and we look forward to providing the recording on our website in a couple of days so thank you all again and have have a great rest of your day. Bye all. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thanks for having us.